Hi, everyone. It's Andrew O'Donnell with The Market Mindset. Today, we're speaking with Dwayne Parnham, who's the chairman and CEO over at Madison Metals, which is a uranium exploration company focused in Namibia. What's so crucial about this project and Namibia in general is that it's close to infrastructure, other active mines, and in fact, uh, the Husab mine is an open pit mine that its production values are in the same league or in that same kind of top tier as Olympic Dam and Cigar Lake. So this is going to be an interesting conversation because we're going to talk about generally uranium as a market looking forward because it's had such a great year, but also the stellar results that have come out of Madison Metals and what it looks like for 2024. Let's go on and talk to Dwayne. So Dwayne, great to see you. Uh, I guess you're back in Florida. You uh, you were at PDAC. You did a, a quick uh, drop by and say hello to everyone. What was PDAC like? Yeah, I look very, very busy again this year. Uh, a lot of excitement and, uh, you know, I mean, um, us uh, gold diggers and, and commodity seekers uh, are always optimistic. So it's a collection of really uh, positive, you know, industry folks and, uh, and financiers and things. So, yeah, it was it was exciting. Well, it looks like it should be an interesting year for sure for gold, but certainly last year and moving forward, who knows for how long, but you know, nuclear and uranium being that backbone, uh, that's really kept a lot of light in this mining sector uh, here at VREC, you name it. There are so many great stories. People, it's keeping that people's attention really focused on uh, who the baseload power realistically and logically is going to be for any kind of energy transition. And you guys uh, have also had some great results back in February 7th, as well as just recently. Um, I won't steal your thunder, but uh, just let us know what your kind of outlook is. Uh, and first, maybe you know, start off with that February 7th release, because that really puts things into perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, I've always felt that we've been in an extremely exciting province for looking for uranium and, and, and Namibia in particular being one of the top uh, producers by country to, uh, to the world supply. Um, there's unlimited potential there. And I think that with our team, we've been there 22 years. We've licensed the uranium mine. We certainly know the landscape very well. Um, so when we, we start doing some groundwork on, a, on another project that we've, um, in the process of acquiring, we're under contract for 90% interest. Uh, it's called the Con Uranium Project. It's a mining license that was issued for copper, but really um, overlooked for uranium. And it adjoins Rossing Uranium Mine, and uh, we're, you know, literally six kilometers away by the crow flies. So to us, this is a very interesting area. Um, overlooked during the last cycle and, and previous cycles because of the copper exploration development on the property. So when we went on site, we found some very, very high grade uh, counts per second following up on a radiometrics airborne survey that we were looking at. And uh, on the February 7th release, we announced some, uh, some of the rush samples that we did uh, on some trenching that the, uh, the, the team on, on site uh, finished just early this year. Uh, and lo and behold, we come up with an 8.47% 8, individual chip sample within a trench. Uh, so that got everyone very, very excited, of course. So um, we've since announced uh, yesterday the balance of those assays. So there's 43 uh, individual assays uh, collected from seven trenches along the 600 meter strike length of this uh, favorable D-type Alaskites. Uh, these are the ones that are impregnated with uh, with mineralization. And uh, what we're finding also in that high grade section is we've got a lot of secondary mineralization happening, which is that type of, you know, fluid en enrichment and placement is uh, very similar to the Rossing, where the Rossing's grade is made up of 40% or so uh, secondary enrichment. But what's got us really excited, I think, which which is showing some potential here is that over 600 meters that we've sampled so far from almost a kilometer long, we've got a good assay distribution on seven trenches, you know, that are kind of averaging out at, at, at grades much higher than what we'd normally see in Namibia. Um, so these are, these are surface samples, they're trenches, they are rock samples. And um, that high grade section where, where I announced the, the eight point or 7% turned out to be a four meter section of 2.78%. So really, really exciting grades coming, coming out of this new, new discovery.
Yeah, it goes without saying, I mean, Namibia is, is a very big player in the world of uranium. And this is maybe a little bit older data, but is it the, the Husab mine? Husab? Yeah, Husab, yep. Yeah, right. yeah, and that's an open pit. And that's like in uh, the same vicinity of production as, you know, Olympic Dam or Cigar Lake, give or take the year. But that's like the size and scope that we're talking about. And what's interesting with that is when people hear, you know, Athabasca uh, and uranium is that, you know, you could talk about the ge geological formations and there's a lot of similarities. You could do exactly the same thing here in Namibia with uh, a major mine being uh, relatively close by. Yeah, uh, look, this discovery is right uh, six kilometers from Rossing. The infrastructure is there. We can drive a pickup truck right to it. These are samples taken from surface. So we're not drilling, you know, 800 meters deep and finding exceptional values. So, you know, uh, on a mining license already. So, you know, look, if this holds together through drilling and we can come up with a significant amount of pounds, this is an easy production scenario that uh, could, uh, could, you know, really excite Madison as, a, as an upcoming producer, let's say. Now you said it was a copper permit. Does it, will it make any difference that if you have to switch it over to a uranium permit at any point, does that affect anything no. in Namibia? No, no. Yeah. So the Namibia laws, you know, if you're, if you're issued a mining license, you can, and, and that license owner is the only one that can layer on other commodity types. No other person could come and layer on a different commodity on a mining license. So we're, we're in good shape for that. Um, that application's in. So um, yeah, so uh, you know, it's basically let's drill it and let's see what we have subsurface. And what's so great about that too is because you hear about uh, people needing, they say, like chain of custody or or supply chain is having a direct route to Europe uh, instead of having to ship something, say, from Athabasca all the way over or to get it from uh, Australia. Or you know, we know that there's issues, you know, because of uh, Kazakhstan and Russia, what that tensions and whatnot to have some uh, options, to, you know, very close to Europe to be able to get some uranium up there uh, is very, very handy on a, like a geopolitical kind of stage as well. Yeah, I would consider Namibia absolutely in a perfect position, you know, like Canada and perhaps Australia, uh, US for that matter. But I mean, Namibia, if you're looking at sub-Sahara Africa, it is absolutely the perfect place for developing a uranium deposit like we're finding. Uh, the infrastructure is there, like I said, there's two existing uh, operating mines, a third one potentially would restart here shortly. Uh, there are some mining licenses issued for uh, uranium operations not far away. One, one I licensed years ago in 2007, 2008, um, it, it's about 150 kilometers away, sub-economic even at today's price, but nonetheless, it's, it's ready to go. And if the, if the economics turn that way, then, you know, that will become a, another interesting scenario that will come into production. But what you can't discount is the fact that when you have this grade, um, which is running right now 10 times out of HUSIP, it'll get diluted when we drill because there'll be some waste rock and, you know, mine planning and all these other issues that will dilute that grade. But to start off with such a significant high grade discovery like we have at surface, knowing the types of rocks we're dealing with because we've, we've drilled these deposits before. So we've got a high level of confidence what we're about to see in the drill, next upcoming drill program that we're preparing for. Um, we've got a lot of assumptions in there. And if this all holds together, this could be a really, really exciting opportunity for us. So like you're kind of saying right now is that you've got the data, you're interpreting it, you're setting probably new targets where you're going to look, where you can expand from. Uh, what are the next kind of steps if someone's kind of looking to say, okay, uh, this is a big bite you've taken already. This is a great start. What's the next milestone someone should be looking for? Yeah, well, so we'll be financing, obviously we're going to finance a drill program and then very shortly we'll be drilling right after that, uh, get on the ground and, and start figuring this thing out. But you look again, they're quite simple. These uh, we're mapping these on surface, you know, we don't have a lot of drilling to do to figure out where to go. We know where to go. It's just a matter of getting it done now. So financing, on the ground drilling, drill results, and then expand to a resource uh, estimate and, and figure out if we can mine it. And once again, one of the great things, too, is that uh, having the infrastructure in place, having other mines nearby to also to impair about, uh, this is the, all of the kind of check boxes someone needs to see, never mind a, a very much in demand commodity uh, that we, it's almost like an urgency that, you know, we need to get enough projects getting going because to meet demand, if there's any attempt to hit, you know, at, at like COP28, where they want the amount of reactors to come forward and to take the role uh, that oil and gas would play, we're going to need uh, a lot of speed and a lot of real government uh, 
energy to to get permits in place and to get good projects with great you know results uh, closer to being active. Yeah, I mean, look, the the whole uranium market has moved quite aggressively, you know, up to last year. This year, early in January, we had some good price movements. We're kind of trying to figure out pricing right now again, which is very healthy for long-term pricing. Um, there's a lot of disruption in uh, finding new supply for longer term for some of the end users. So I think, you know, this imbalancing that's that's happening and rebalancing creates a lot of really good opportunity for explorers like us. Because the projections are in 2027, the production of, of all these mines that are currently under operation is going to dramatically decrease at a time when uh, demand is increasing. So there's a huge gap. Uh, in production, something in the order of, you know, 1.5, 1.6 billion pounds into 2040. So if the utilities now are starting to think longer term in their pricing contracts, um, where they've, you know, been enjoying short term, you know, moderately priced uh, product easily accessible is starting to become more of a problem. So, you know, thinking a little bit longer term now, I think that's where the opportunity is going to be for a new producer. So when you get imbalance, people looking for new supply, uh, looking for new contracts and all these things, that really creates an environment where, you know, little companies like us can really shine. So we're, we're looking forward to that, meeting those demand uh, parameters in the future. So, yeah, that's what we're working for. It's interesting with pricing, too, because some people look and they go, oh, it's 2008 over again. It's spiked. It's going to come back down. But every analyst I, I've talked to or seen, whether at VREC and I'm sure at PDAC as well, is it, this is a very different world because of the sheer commitment uh, from all the COP28 countries uh, to the amount of work they're going to put in towards the sector. And just as you're saying as well, uh, Kazakh Tom Prom from Kazakhstan, I think they're anticipating like a 17% reduction in production this year, whereas Cameco is bringing on Cigar Lake a bit more, that we're, we're finding this, there's going to be a new balance and a, and a new kind of uh, outlook moving forward. Uh, and everyone needs to find their place, I guess, with what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, look, I was through that 2007 fundamentals when uh, I was putting Valencia into production and looking for end user contracts. So, you know, the fundamental difference that I've seen from 2007 move to today is that in 2007, a lot of countries were shutting down reactors. So the so the underlying fundamental environment back then wasn't as strong as you see today, where new reactor builds are, are at record paces, um, extensions to existing operating facilities are, are in place. So countries have turned around, Ger Germany, uh, Canada, for example, even Japan, where they were shutting down reactors and now restarting and actually building. So that underlying fundamental buying power that's coming in uh, is is much different than we saw in 07. So, I mean, again, my thought here would be even that $100 uranium, we still haven't peaked out at uh, 2007 prices if you adjust for inflation. You know, that's something in around $200 per pound we should see today. So yeah. I would suspect that we'll get a move after this kind of correction and, and rebalancing we're doing right now, which is a very healthy move for a substantial move higher. So I would think the next level would be somewhere around $200 a pound. And then and then we'll see what happens from there. Well, this thing's got legs. I mean, people are, are, are coming around and that's a great thing too, whether it's uh, Republican or Democrat, they're both on side uh, for nuclear. That always makes life easy as well. Uh, and Canada's adopting as well. They're turning, you know, you know, getting reactors going. So it's a perfect scenario. And really when we have them on side to, I guess, alleviate and ease any of the the Netflix movies that kind of fear monger uh, nuclear, that's going to make the process a lot smoother as well. And it looks like uh, this isn't just, you know, uh, uh, that we're having a commodity run, is that this has legs for a long time moving forward. Public opinion has changed, environmental sentiment has changed, uh, politician, global acceptance to um, nuclear being a green energy has changed. Uh, Canada just sold 5.5 billion in green bonds to support their nuclear initiative. So, you know, France has already um, disclosed uh, nuclear is green. So I think, you know, that whole movement and support underlying this next move is very, very important. And again, uh, the fundamentals uh, nowadays are supporting a much stronger uranium environment, which helps us miners look for new products.
Well, everyone, keep your eyes open because as mentioned, they might be doing a raise and you're going to want to look, look out to and, and reach out to Dwayne and Madison Metals. You can also reach out to me and I'll pass along the information to them. Uh, it was great talking to you. Great results. I mean, that's what we want to see regardless Thank of you. the markets, but great results, a great project and a, and a safe jurisdiction that has a great potential to feed uh, Africa and all of Europe. Uh, we look forward to seeing the next steps. Thanks again, Andrew. Really look forward to it ourselves.